Hey, how are you guys doing? Welcome to the Kevin Devani Connection Show. You know, I've always find it fascinating when people come from, you know, conventional professions or mainstream journalism or any other field and, you know, they go deep down the rabbit hole uh, for whatever time uh, and, you know, and there's already a bunch of, you know, good articles and books and, and art, you know, and, and publications. But when somebody like John Tinkelenberg comes out of nowhere and uh, starts researching and intends, you know, to write a book about it, about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm always, you know, curious, like, what's the process? What is the vision? What, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of values do they adhere to, to Bitcoin? What do they see in Bitcoin? What kind of hopes, visions, dreams? Um, what kind of solutions do they see in Bitcoin? So uh, the process of, you know, of understanding, of comprehending, of transferring also this knowledge it's really uh, fascinating to me. So without further ado, this is my talk with John Tinkelenberg. Really for looking forward to that. And make sure you follow me on Twitter, subscribe to the YouTube channel and podcast platforms. And uh, yeah, hope you're going to enjoy this. I'll see you soon again. Hey, John, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you, you bet. Uh, John, I mean, you came out of nowhere, if I may start like that. You came out of nowhere into the Bitcoin space. Um, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself, my, you know, my listeners, I think we're really, really curious where you're from and uh, how you got into Bitcoin. Okay. Well, um, a little bit about me is I'm a, I'm a reporter by trade. Um, I went to school for journalism at uh, Elon University here in America. And um, I went the newspaper route. I was a reporter for, for a little while and uh, working on the political beat, um, primarily local government, a little bit of state and federal elections, but the um, it's a great, great career um, if you love being in the center of the conversation at all times, but there are always those um, ethical dilemmas, you know, because uh, people, it's very easy to mislead and a lot of people, they think that like the media has a liberal bias, uh, which I kind of have a unique take on that. I think it's, I mean, I think it's pretty natural. Um, when you kind of see how everybody lives, more or less, because there's that saying that one half doesn't know how the other half lives. And so uh, kind of the, the, the huge um, mechanics behind it, I decided to leave traditional journalism. And since then, I've kind of taken a meandering path to marketing. And uh, I was doing that when um, COVID-19 came out of nowhere. And like the rest of us, it just kind of flipped everything upside down. And I was fortunate enough in that I could work from home. And I, you know, there were no sports, there were no concerts, not really a whole lot of TV. Um, and you could, you could still read books, at least, you know, I don't think they found out about that yet. And uh, I, so I just started, you know, look, I was sitting there saying, look, if I'm just going to sit here, I might as well get paid. <laughs> And so I started looking at investing and uh, I didn't go the full on Robin Hood route. Although I, I've subscribed to Wall Street bets for years. Um, it's, it's just funny to see how, how everybody thinks. And uh, so I came, to, I came to investing and to into Bitcoin through Lynn Alden. Um, her newsletter and her service is fantastic. Um, yeah, she's and brilliant. She, she was I mean, talking she's brilliant about brain. Bitcoin. I mean, I can, all, I can. I'm always like in admiration of her. She's like, I don't know how she developed her knowledge or intelligence, but she's amazing. Yeah, yeah one of one of the sharpest writers I've ever seen. And uh, so she started talking about it, and that's that's when I fell down the rabbit hole. And I, I don't think I've ever come out of. Maybe I've come out the other side. Who knows? Um, and uh, so. I came to Bitcoin as a noob and started studying it. Um, and uh, I've listened to so many podcasts, read so many books. I, I started started hodling in May last year. Great time to get in, of course. And, uh, and, you know, I'm one of those people where the blob has consumed me. And I'm at a point now where I'm, it's like, how can I give back to the blob? <laughs> and uh, so what I'm working on right now is I is when I kind of thought about the last year is, is that I can see a pretty strong story arc here from COVID-19 being this call to adventure, everything changes to where 
I'm looking at Bitcoin and all of the events of the last year through kind of a first person narrative, like a Hunter S. Thompson book. Um, he wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and studied Hell's Angels through a first person lens that um, it's not the traditional, the mainstream way, but like, I believe he tries to capture the spirit of the movement and that's what I'm trying to do. And so I um, started reaching out to people in a, and thankfully Corey Clipston at a Swan Bitcoin is really helpful setting this up today. And, uh, and so uh, I'm planning on going to Bitcoin 2021 because I see that it being kind of like this Woodstock level moment for what has been a, an incredible year for Bitcoin. And so, yeah, yeah. that's, that's a long winded answer, but that's how I got here. Yeah. It was super exciting. Um, now I wish I could go to Miami in, um, in June, but you know, we have a, my girlfriend, and I have a three month um, old baby girl. So is a lot, you know, of, you know, and then we have to move and uh, to the to the more countryside. But I wish we could, yeah, we could meet one day. So, John, um, you said you you're working on a, um, if I um, if I may mention that you're working on a book, right? Sort of a, is a work in progress. Right. Like, is it about Bitcoin Renaissance? Is that like the working title? The uh, well, the uh, the working title I have right now is uh, "All Your Models Are Destroyed." That famous quote from Sailor, um, and because uh, that's kind of how I see this working out. I mean, COVID-19 flipped everything on its head to dematerialize so many things. I mean, I mean, it used to be if, if you and I wanted to chat, we could, you know, call long distance or maybe I could fly there. And now here we are on Zoom, which I'd never really even used Zoom before all of this started. And uh, so I see this as this kind of generational moment where everything has changed. And when you look at COVID-19 and the response of the money printing and all of the stimulus, it's kind of a, it's a cause and effect. It's, it's pretty clear to me. I'm not an economist. I'm not a, a developer, but you know, I'm just a guy and that's the way I see it. Um, and so I, I'm looking at it through, I'm looking at this Renaissance from kind of a little bit of a historical perspective, although not as much as say breed love for Alan Farrington. Um, Cause Frankly, they're, they're way smarter than I am. <laughs> but uh, I'm looking at it as a as like a culture a revolution and um, trying to trying to distill in, you know, 300, 400 pages, just what it's like to be in this moment in time. OK, let's go down the rabbit hole. Um, when you say. I'm just paraphrasing you, but I think you 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 uh, once you I think you got in touch with Bitcoin, you went into the rabbit hole, and you, I think um, I'm not don't want to put words into your mouth, but do you see like structural problems? What are the structural? Because this is what really fascinates me right now, because there's so much structural issues we have, uh, whether it be the central banks or you know, self-elected entities um, with criminal immunity. This is what really fascinates me. It's like the big elephant in the room, uh, not to mention, you know, nation states, governments, military industrial complex, you know, and everything around it. It's, it's so mind boggling if you think about it. What do you see in Bitcoin that can like structurally transform everything, our whole human civilization? When you talk about, you know, um, Renaissance, for example, I mean, what would the Renaissance of human civilization mean to you? Oh. I think that um, in a way, th since 2008, um, there has been a lot of smoke and mirrors coming out of the financial system as it exists. Um, when I was when I was 16, I worked at a pizza restaurant here in North Carolina. I made seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. It was minimum wage here in 2008. That wage has not changed at all. The minimum wage here is still seven dollars and twenty five cents. And since that time, the Fed has printed a, more than eleven trillion dollars, and that's more money than even existed back then. And so we're talking about an entire generation, my millennial generation and Gen Z, to where our future has just been robbed from us. And um, you know, I actually think that. America, the Constitution, it has tremendous promise. It's a, it's a, a wonderful system and um, so many great checks and balances and freedoms and rights. I think that it's that we're missing a fundamental component, and that is sound money. 
I don't think the founding fathers, when they drafted the constitution, they had this notion that we could someday have a, a true hard asset. And so um, if you don't have that, you end up with the psychological, um, not well psychological, but just human nature. Human nature takes over and politicians just, they borrow and print, borrow and print. Um, and I think until we kind of get back on a, on a true hard money Bitcoin standard, um, the unrest is just going to get worse. And um, so many of the problems right now you see are because we're trusting in the wrong thing. Like the U.S. dollar says, uh, in God we trust. And I think it says that because it sure as shit ain't numbers. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of my take. Now, there are some positive developments. I mean, you know, I mean, I always I, I used to live like five years in California and I used to say, you know, everything that's like really innovative, like advancing things, progressive or, you know, something, a new development, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it, or sometimes in most of it, it depends what, what we're talking about, comes from the United States. All right. It's a really great country, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, yes, uh, you, you know, there's the Constitution, there's the Bill of Rights, there's, you know, the Founding Fathers, there's the principles, the ethical principles, but it's been hijacked. John, isn't hasn't it been? I mean, there's some positive developments now with you know Senator uh, Cynthia Lummis or uh, what, what's his uh, name, uh, Congressman Warren Davidson, and you know Rand Ron Paul and his son. These are like the libertarians, right? These are the I would call them the polit the ethical politicians, the ethical decision makers. But they don't have that much leverage at the moment. But it, do you think it's gaining momentum? I see it gaining momentum. I mean the. The, the sheer number of, of uh, people that are getting into it. Once I started getting into Bitcoin, just asking around, um, so many so many people on the street that I talk to, um, they're like, oh yeah, I have Bitcoin. And maybe they they probably aren't as into it as I am, but they uh, but they at least see that, yeah, there's, there's some merit there. And I think pretty much anybody you talk to, they say, hey, look, yeah, Bitcoin may have been a fad the first time or the second time, but fads don't come around three times. <laughs> and uh, so this, I think this is fundamentally different. And um, it's like before COVID, all I knew about Bitcoin was that a lot of people made a lot of money of it. And I think I heard some story about a guy that made so much money, he hired somebody to dig a tunnel under his house and the tunnel collapsed. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I forget where that story was, but um, perhaps it was an urban legend or something like that. But uh, that was all I knew about Bitcoin before COVID because uh, it wasn't until COVID-19, I was sitting on 60 Minutes watching Neil Kashkari saying, you know, don't worry, everything's fine. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, we have infinite cash. <laughs> that was the that that? words, it's unbelievable. I mean, yeah, in, in infinite face, cash. You know, sometimes I'm like, you know, how, I mean, how, how, you know, scrupulous or, or non-scrupulous, you know, they have no scruples anymore. And it's like in our face, it's, you know, whether you take the World Economic Forum or Bill Gates, it's like, you know, they're telling us in our face, it's like, you know, as if they wanted to tell us, you know, we're going to execute this agenda. And afterwards, we're going to tell you, we told you so, you know, sometimes it seems to me a little, really like uh, crazy, really crazy. It I, I agree. And I, I think it's, it's, I don't necessarily think that these people are evil. I try not to attribute to malice what is easily explainable by stupidity. And th the reality is we, they're still working with the same tools from 30, 40 years ago. Um, the idea that we could just print fiat money indefinitely. Um, and, it, and that rose up in an age before the internet. Um, and I mean, there's no reason that a transaction should take two days to settle. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and meanwhile, Bitcoin settles in, in 10 minutes. Um, it's, it's just no comparison. Is there something, John, that really concerns you when you think about, you know, I mean, you know, we, we finally, I think most people I think have figured out even in the mainstream that Bitcoin cannot be banned. It cannot be stopped. The cat is out of the bag. Pandora's box has been open like since 12 years now in the monetary revolution. It's been declared like what dead 
for like 350, 400 times. So it's over. The game is over. We're going into the already actually in the process of hyper Bitcoinization. But are there like, is there any like a process where you think this could be a problem? I mean, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, freedom, you know, or moving, you know, I mean, look at the lockdown, the vaccination, the European Court of Human Rights just declared in their newest whatever verdict that it's uh, it's totally okay to have compuls compulsory, mandatory vaccination. Unbelievable. But, you know, do you see where I'm going with this? I mean, do you see any problem along this path? Um, when it comes to to Bitcoin, and obviously it's a it's a public ledger, I think there are two things that I worry the most about it. Um, one of them being the, I, I think that one day um, that governments will try to levy property taxes upon it, similar to how they do with real estate. Um, and, uh, and I'm okay with, with some taxes, you know, I'm okay with paying a little bit of money and having some services performed. Um, I'm not okay with just being taxed to oblivion. Um, and uh, I think the second thing I kind of worry about, and I don't necessarily think this is a threat, but I think that this is a case where there's a mismatch between the perception and reality. Um, you, you've probably seen a lot of people talking about the climate change component. And I think that that's a, that's, that's a tough narrative to win with people because I think... Uh, like energy is is everything and we use it for so many different purposes and i think it's a bit unfair to really characterize bitcoin as a poor use of energy um but a lot of people they say you know oh these miners are burning energy that's bad <laughs> but i've never seen anybody question driving someplace in a car <laughs> if they really want to go there um it's it's kind of a case where we're all okay with using our energy, but we're we're not okay with other people using energy. They can do it. They can figure some other way out. Um, but I think that we, I think the Bitcoin community as a whole, we need to kind of really be, really have a strong defense for climate change um, that's succinct and easy for people to understand. And uh, I mean, there are a lot of great people that are working on that right now. And Nick Carter's been putting a lot of good stuff out there explaining that like, look, you know, if anything, if anything, um, gathering energy, encrypting it and having Bitcoin is almost like a unit of energy and time is a powerful thing. And at least it can't be gamified or completely made up by somebody in Washington. Um, so I think that's, that's something that I kind of worry about a little bit. I think it's easy for the media to pick on Bitcoin because of that. And um, it's prob that's probably more of a concern of mine than necessarily government banning it. Because I just, I just don't think the government has its act together. We kind of saw what happened with COVID. Um, they're slow to move, slow to act. And uh, there was a, you brought up a really good point earlier about um, America and politicians, some politicians really getting involved with, with uh, Bitcoin, like Cynthia Loomis. And um, like, I know Patrick McHenry, who was the uh, congressman where I grew up, he, he, kind of took an interesting step and started hosting a white paper on his site. And uh, I think that there are a lot of really smart people that are looking at this and seeing the future. Um, they, I mean, it's a small minority right now, but um, I think that's pretty indicative of where the population is. Um, as far as the rest of the country and in the world as well, it's kind of, I think it's hard to let go of something that we think is working. Um, it's part of why startups come up and overtake the big players. Um, there's there's a little bit of perceived career risk in this. And um, obviously, I'm here right now because I don't believe that's the case. <laughs> and uh, there's, I think, time will bear this out. Yeah. And what the, you know, all this FUD is concerned, uh, you know, as you said, you know, not only Nick Carter, but there's so many brilliant people out there with this Christopher Bendixson or... Uh, you know, um, uh, Hess McCook, uh, Dan Held, it's like, you know, whatever topic, uh, you know, related, it's it, all this fat has already been discredited and debunked, you know, like so many, so many times, it, like in, in, 
in this, you know, in the tiniest detail you can imagine, you know, would it be this whole energy FUD or whatever? So, you know, it'll just take its own uh, path. And, and I think, you know, the incentivization game is already on. And I think the proof is in the pudding, you know, I mean, look at uh, Marty Bent with his uh, great American mining. He just brought a, a a really one of his best, if not the best newsletter today. You should read, have you read it already? Um, I'm not I sure, you not. should subscribe, yeah, yeah. And so he's talking, you know, like um, he's saying that, I'm just paraphrasing sort of if, for example, the state of Wyoming, any other state, you know, goes like with full intention into Bitcoin mining and, you know, and and uses all the resources and, and, and they can even, you know, alleviate somehow the tax burden on the people or even maybe sort of a, have a UBI, you know, I mean, there's nothing against the UBI, but I think once we have like a hyper Bitcoinization or, a, or a deflation economy uh, rooted in Bitcoin, I think people won't even need, you know, to waste so much energy and time thinking about investment or whatever, because it's a deflationary money, you know, it, 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 it will just increase in purchasing power by order of magnitude. And finally, you know, we're going to have a money where people, you know, can, uh, you know, take care of themselves and the families and their children, the children's children, uh, without having, you know, to have a headache, you know, and and uh, and and saving is going to be, you know, not something, you know, that we're going to be crucified for in in uh, according to the Keynesian <laughs> economists, but uh, it's it's yeah, it's mind-boggling. It's a total paradigm shift in thinking, in behavior, in psychology emotional state of mind in, in, uh, you know, taking care of, of your, of your, of your future self, you know? I agree. And, um, I think the, the Austrian economists do a really great job of explaining the business cycle component. Um, because we see it right now every day to where people, people make poor investments when they think there's more of a safety net and a backstop than there really is. And, um, when you extrapolate that over an entire economy, it's it's easy to see the waves in which this takes place. And uh, when people are, when people finally grasp that, okay, resources are finite, money is finite, and so is our time, I think that people will be more careful about the choices they make and the opportunities they choose to pursue. Because um, we see a lot of a lot of interesting trends that come up. Say uh, you want to you want to make some sort of uh, some sort of app. If it's a popular video game, then like a bunch of people rush in in cr coming up with copycat apps just because they um, they see the opportunity. They think, oh, if this is successful. I'll surely be successful as well, even though we're in very much a winner take all economy. And so I I want people to be a little bit more careful and realize that like you know. The money that we have right now is is completely a fugazi, <laughs> and it's uh, hopefully when we re reunite our our culture around um, just what it means to be fiscally solvent, so many of our problems will go away. <laughs> do you know, or do you, would you would you think that people who are you know who come in touch with Bitcoin, let's say for the first time, are aware of the you know, of the second, third order effects or what consequences it could have. Like, you know, we, you know, amongst Bitcoin as libertarians, also, you know, we talk about, you know, separation of money and state. But I don't think people really understand what that really means in a positive way. Like what kind of implications that have or what kind of, you know, uh, abundance, you know, you know, you probably know, you've heard of Jeff Booth. I've had him on, you know, together with Titus Gable of Free Private Cities. Uh, it was amazing talk, you know, and his book is just brilliant. Every, you know, seven-year-old child can can understand what he's talking about. Um, do you think that people, I mean, have a uh, at least an imagination when it comes to Bitcoin, like what kind of of new world or new civilization we can have? I think that's I think that's a great way of looking at what the when it comes to understanding Bitcoin, what the mountain is. Um, because I think a lot of people, they look at Bitcoin, they see it's a cryptocurrency, it lives on the internet, and they more or less think it's like, oh, it's kind of like some sort of video game currency. Um, it's like rupees and Legend of Zelda. Uh, <laughs> but in reality, I think what really makes it click for people is when they, they understand the basic 
um, principles of it. Like, look, it's scarce. It's uh, it can't be can't be banned. It's decentralized. Um, you could put it on a hard wallet and like forget about it in your closet for a hundred years, and it'll still be there. And uh, what people when people understand that and they take a step back and see where it fits in the broader picture that like there's a reason that it was designed in this way that um, I think once you finally get that, that's when people start to grasp the second and third order effects of like, oh yeah, when we have this, they can't really, you know, keep borrowing and printing forever. Um, I think it, it's a, it's kind of a stupid two stage process. Um, you know, I meant just mentioned free private cities, you know, from, um, Titus Gable, uh, you know, he, his book also is called Free Private City. Have you ever like thought about what, um, because I think Marty Bent uh, mentioned that in his, in, his, in his latest newsletter today about um, a potential secession, you know, where a state, you know, whether it be Wyoming, whatever could secede from the federal government. Um, now let's just, you know, let's just not even go there. I'm just saying, just asking you like, do you think we'll have, sort of like citadels or free private cities or sort of localized economies, you know, everything rooted in Bitcoin um, where, you know, actually, you know, the government is, has a role actually, you know, to, to serve, to protect um, uh, property rights, security, and, you know, uh, guarantee security and all of that. So do, do you think like private entrepreneurs, companies, you know, service providers could do this kind of, you know, take over this kind of role much cheaper, much more efficiently, and then have, you know, localized economy rooted in Bitcoin. And, you know, we'll have all our freedoms as an individual, as a sovereign individual. I think that's a, it's an interesting concept. Um, and I think that we're a ways from that because obviously when you, there's so much of the infrastructure that you don't really need on a Bitcoin standard that a lot of the financial system is, is a waste. A lot of the insurance system is a waste. The, and so it's, I feel like something like that's almost too hard to fathom, but you see a little bit of it kind of starting right now with, um, with uh, states like, like Wyoming, states like Kentucky, which just passed that mining incentive law to where the free market among states is already kind of bearing this out. And there are some, there will be certainly be some laggards. Um, the ones that are, that are most steeped in this, uh, this kind of borrow and print cycle. There's a reason people are leaving California for Texas type of scenario. And, uh, but as far as, well, I mean, I, I suppose that makes sense because there are certainly governments that, are, that get this more than others and because i know there there are governments like india that are talking about banning it um and meanwhile america we've always kind of kind of relied on innovation let it run wild and if it's bad then we'll rein it in <laughs> so i think maybe in like generations we'll see entire governments that run on this stuff and then maybe more maybe more like banana republic unstable countries that are still struggling to get onto the Bitcoin standard, or maybe they just waited too long. Mm -hmm. Now with everything going on, you know, you talk about the central banks, you talk about, you know, the whole, um, it's very turbulent times right now, you know, I mean, socially, economically, it's, it's a nightmare actually. So uh, what I'm, what I'm curious about, like, what, what's the sentiment around, you know, the people with, or, you know, the people that are friends, relatives, uh, colleagues or whatever what's the sentiment you're getting <clears throat> when it comes to bitcoin i, I mean connection people, with bitcoin. the connection with bitcoin i think this particular cycle people are starting to wake up to it a little more um that people are people have seen the headlines of it of it going you know 20x in basically one year and that, that is resonating with people because um, that's what's grabbing the attention. But I think on a deeper level, people understand something is wrong here, that the system is rigged in some way. And a lot of people are struggling to connect the dots. Um, I've, I've been trying to, to orange pill people a little bit, so to speak. And uh, it's, 
I think it's a tough thing to grasp what a sound money looks like when you've been addicted to fiat money for so long. Um, but I think that little by little people are grasping it and um, we're seeing more and more adoption, more and more addresses on the blockchain every day. And it's just a slow and steady progress. So it's become already mainstream. Do you have the impression? I mean, you know, we're so early. It's like 2% of the Earth's population are into Bitcoin or may, we can't even call them like 100 million people like hodless, but at least they're in one shape, shape or another, they are into Bitcoin. So we're so early. And uh, do you see like, a, a, you know, as to, to, to use Parker Lewis term, terminology again, you know, like gradually and suddenly uh, a shift into, you know, like beyond mainstreaming, beyond like uh, sort of a adoption rate taking place? Um, I think that I, I see that happening to where when um, the momentum reaches a critical mass, it just becomes hard to stop. And like a, like a lot of things, like any, any, any sort of new trend in business or a gold rush, um, the, oh, the masses love to jump in long after the upside is gone, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, the so I, I have no doubt that um, once once we reach past a a certain certain percentage of holders that it's it's just unstoppable to where it's it's I mean when when 10, 20 percent of the Earth's population has it, I mean it's in the news every day. It's in the it's in every single um, business publication. It's probably got its own spot on the CNBC ticker. It's just um, once. I mean, it doesn't even have to reach a majority, just a, just a decent plurality or a sizable minority. Half a billion? Half a billion people? Is that realistic? Um, half a billion people. Like with any other technology, yeah, John, like, people. you know, like if you think about, you know, mobile phones or whatever, uh, Android or something like that, like, you know, once the half a billion uh, a tipping point was reached, I think it was really, uh, it went like exponential. But, you know, just my guess. Yeah, I, that makes sense, especially when you factor in Metcalf's law. Um, the, there becomes just a, a point where you can't, you can't stop it and you can't duplicate it. We see that all the time with some of the altcoins um, to where they just say, hey, look, hey, look, we're just where Bitcoin was in its first six months. <laughs> we'll be the same one day. And it's it's just ridiculous. But the, um, I mean, I think, I mean, it's hard to quantify what that number exactly is. And I, I'm not so much of a so much of an economist. But I mean, I think certainly within the next two or three years, we'll reach yes. that number, yeah. and things will take off. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. Really unexpected. Is. Yeah, it's going to be unexpected. Because I think even this year, there are some processes taking place. And I think we, we, you know, our human brain, you know, like we talk about this a lot, is not really wired for, you know, for exponential functions or by order of magnitude, whatever process or developments that is, you know, uh, whether that be the price. But, you know, I always tell people, don't think in fiat terms. You think you need to think in purchasing power. And I think people have don't even have a you know uh, the slightest imagination of what kind of purchasing power we're talking about. You know, uh, with the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. You know, and uh, yeah. So, has anything changed in your life, John? I mean, since you've come into in touch with Bitcoin, and now you're deep in the rabbit hole. You know, you're working on your book, and um, w what has changed in your life since then? I think. I think I'm a lot more calm in general. Um, I think I feel a lot more comfortable with my place in the universe. I think once I found this, this once I found Bitcoin, I think for the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of purpose. I think that's missing from a lot of people in my generation um, because wages have stayed flat for so long. And, um, I know at this point, my wife's probably tired of hearing about it. <laughs> and so that's part of why I'm happy to, to kind of to start um, putting myself out there and meeting more Bitcoiners. Um, it's been kind of a recent endeavor of mine. Um, once, I, once I left traditional newspaper journalism, I, I tried to stay relatively private um, because 
covering politics, you've come across a lot of really interesting and sometimes shady characters. Um, but I used to live the Anon life, but once I, once I found this, I just kind of had to stand up and be counted because I think it can fix so much and it's made me a lot more confident. And I think, I think I'm a more patient person as a result, low time preference, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, it is true. And there's a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, amongst myself, you know, that do admit, you know, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, I think we all would be hopeless, if not even depressive, you know, because it, it, I think the, our civilization, this, or this system, this matrix has come already uh, so far ahead. You know, it's like we have no, we sometimes we really, I think people have, have feel they have no control over anything. You know, they cannot influence anything or change anything, transform anything. So with Bitcoin, it goes like to the root, you know, to the essence of any, everything you can think of, you know, whether it be whatever, science, technology, art, culture, a communication, empathy, you know, or just, you know, or just uh, materialistic well-being, you know, or or uh, freedom, liberty, anything you can think of. Mm -hmm. So, John, uh, yeah, um, uh, anything uh, you want to before we wrap this up? Uh, anything you want to add, like uh, you, that you think is important to share with the audience, with my listeners? I think. Um... I, I believe it's it's important to, to keep an open mind and to be patient with people. Um, something that I see a lot on a, on Bitcoin Twitter is, uh, you know, I think it's it's a function of, of where we are at in Bitcoin's journey. I mean, people, especially people that have been around for a long time, they're tired of shitcoiners and they're tired of, you know, people bringing up the same old FUD. But I think it's it's just a natural part of the process. People... I mean, let's let's be real. This Bitcoin is is hard to grasp because it is just so revolutionary, and I think it's important to to just uh, I don't know, be nice, <laughs> yeah. be patient, and have a low time preference. Exactly. You know, I was actually I was trying to um, I formed a group. You know, I tried to bring uh, different well known Bitcoiners together, and so we can make a film project. I really seriously, and I already mm -hmm. in touch, you know, with filmmakers, and he said, you know, he would even co-produce. But you know, people want to do their own things. It's okay. Do you think there's something missing in the, what I'm trying to ask? Is like, do you think there's something missing in the, or something could be more helpful in communicating this vision, the comprehension, the knowledge, or you know, anything that uh, to, in order to make people understand what is Bitcoin really about, would it be documentary, a movie or whatever, uh, something? I, I think that um, something that can be helpful that I've started doing with people that I talk to is, is um, it's, I think a lot of us, we love Bitcoin and we want to start right at Bitcoin. But in many ways, I think it can be helpful to start right at the problem. I think if you show people a chart of the, the, the M2 supply of the last 10, 15 years, and then show them what the wages have been for the last 10, 15 years. And I think immediately people will understand something is wrong. Um, so I think framing it from a problem solution standpoint is a powerful way to get the narrative across. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, excellent uh, closing words. So John, uh, where can people find you? Are there any resources you want to direct my listeners to? And uh, I hope you're going to come, you know, uh, maybe in the future to a panel discussion on my show. And I'm sure you're going to be invited to other podcasts. Um, yeah. Where can people find you? Any other, you know, information you want to share? Yeah, I can be, I can be found on a, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter username is JTWriting21. Um, I'm, there's not too many John Tinklenbergs out there, so I'm pretty easy to find. And uh, I can also, uh, we found on Telegram as well, JT Writing 21. Yeah. So really enjoyed this uh, conversation, John, and we'll stay in touch. And uh, yeah, uh, wish you really best luck for your book. Thank you so much, Kevin. Okay. This was Bye, fun. John. I enjoyed it. Okay. That was a really fascinating conversation. I mean, I always love to talk with, you know, plebs or new newcomers uh, who are you know, maybe since recently into the rabbits, uh, Bitcoin's rabbit hole. So make sure you follow uh, John Tinkelenberg or JT 
on Twitter, Telegram, or LinkedIn. And I hope, you know, he's going to come up with uh, publish his book uh, sometime soon. And so we can have, you know, more discussions and more insights, more knowledge transfer. So uh, yeah, make sure you follow me on Twitter, subscribe, please, to my YouTube channel and to my podcast platforms, podcast show, The Cave on Davani Connection. And uh, I'll see you around. Thank you so much for listening. 